All right, today's message, it is called Let Freedom Ring. This weekend, as far as I know, this is Memorial Day weekend. And the freedom that we have today, how many of you appreciate the freedom that you have? Raise your hand. Okay, so if you don't raise your hand, you have no problem with someone just coming lock you up because I don't care about my freedom. But we all know that I, we all cherish the freedom that we have. Living in America, we often overlook the fact that we have the privilege to enjoy unrestricted freedom in various aspects of life. Do we have a freedom of speech in this country? Yes or no? If you go to, if you go to China, there's no freedom of speech or the social media that you may go on on your daily basis. They're not able to. They're not allowed to use those, those social media platforms. What about the freedom to move? Can you move to Texas, if you will? Or Florida, Tennessee? Yes, we can move anywhere we want. But in North Korea, for example, it is not possible to relocate to different cities without obtaining permission from the government, which is rarely granted. What about the freedom of worship, freedom of religion that we have today here. If you look at the situations of the world, no matter where you are, the religious freedom is only getting worse. And you can see this um, red area over there. They don't really have any religious freedom. Even in China, you, they may say that, well, there is a church and everything. All the churches are controlled by the government. We hear horrible stories from North Korean defectors when they're captured uh, while they're worshiping. They don't even get treated like a human beings. What about the freedom of press? Not a lot of nations in the world have the freedom of press that we are enjoying in America. News organizations can actively pursue the truth in this country, even holding the government accountable in their reporting. What about right to vote? Every four years, things are getting very interesting because of the election. Every four years, we have the opportunity to exercise our right to vote and participate in the election of the president. And it is often overlooked that many individuals worldwide do not have the same level of freedom we enjoy today. You might wonder, why don't they fight for their freedom? But the major challenge lies in the fact that people in those countries are often unaware that their freedom has been taken away. This is a picture of North Korea. Still looks like this today in 2023. I had an opportunity to go and visit North Korea in 2002. And when I landed, well, I actually sailed. So there's only one portion of the area they opened for the tourists. So, and now they're not doing that anymore. When I got there, I was looking around. By the way, the air quality in North Korea was amazing. Man, they're so pure. <laughs> The food that I, I, I got there was amazing because they, they had their farms there. So the, the tour, we got all the vegetables that was actually grown in North Korean soil. But the scenery looked familiar. I was like, I've, I feel like I saw this kind of scenery somewhere. And then I remember that I saw that scenery in my father's picture when he was in his 20s. In 1960s and 70s Korea, the same scene was there in North Korea in 2002. And it's still still the same. But people living in North Korea, they do not know that they're living in this locked up country and they still worship their leaders. Yeah, you go to Pyongyang, they have these two big statues of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-un and people go on a regular basis and, and put their flowers, and literally they worship their leaders because they don't know that their freedom has been taken away. 
So every now and then in South Korea, we get North Korean defectors. And they say that they thought the whole world was like North Korea. They didn't see any problem of their system until they escaped from the living hell that they were in. But do you think South Korea, South Korea was much different than North Korea? No, it wasn't. South Korea wasn't much different than North Korea from North Korea because there were military governments for several decades after the Korean War. Right after the Korean War, we had a democratic government, but in 1960, there was a military coup. Milton, you may remember. You're old enough to remember that. <laughs> anyway, so from the 60s, all the right for, right for voting and everything was taken away. And as people are getting more educated, they start to think about having democracy, the freedom. We don't want all these restrictions. So they start to come out to the street to the protest. Whenever the protesters came out, they were, there was something called KCIA. So in 1960s and 70s, the government agent, they secretly grabbed and kidnapped those activists and, and tortured them. And but then in the 1980s, they could not really hold it anymore. So now that even ordinary people start to come out to protest on the street. In 1980, May 18, something happened in a city called Gwangju. Why do I remember the date, 1980, May 18? It's because that's when my parents got married in, Korea, in Seoul. So in, when in Seoul, people were getting married, nothing was happening. Four hours away from Seoul, now people gather together, trying to protest, but there's no internet back in the days. There's no Twitter back in the days. Only what the government had to do, cut the phone line. They cut the phone lines, and they isolate the city, and the people you see, they came out here, and now they put all the military units there. And the president, he made an order, open fire. So when they're captured, they were treated very badly. And there were a lot worse pictures there, but I couldn't really put it up there because we have some little mind here. But, you know, people fought against the dictatorship. And resulting of this protest, there were over 4,000 casualties. It wasn't until 1987 that we were able to vote for the president. So the military government in Korea began in 1961, and it wasn't until 1987 that the Korean people regained their right to vote. So it took 26 years of relentless struggle to finally achieve freedom. So here are some important points I've learned about the fight for freedom. Number one, the pursuit of freedom is, not, is, is a lengthy process. Number two, immediate results are not guaranteed. Patience and perseverance are necessary. Number three, the battle for freedom demands unwavering commitment and substantial sacrifices. And number four, the freedom that I enjoy today is a result of someone who selflessly shed their blood and made great sacrifice. Would you agree with this? The people in Guangzhou, when they died, they fought for the next generation. In their mind, I don't want my children to live the same life that I have lived. That was the motivation for them to go out and protest. And the same principles may apply to our spiritual journey, which aims to liberate us from the bondage of sin. The book of Exodus we've been studying, that provides us with valuable insight on how we can navigate through our own journey as we're trying to fight for the, the freedom. Because the Israelites, they were slaves. They did not have any freedom. And now the book is telling us the journey that they had to take to regain the freedom 
that they were supposed to have. So last time we were at chapter 5, and now we are at chapter 6. So if reflecting on chapter 5, we discover that the, when Moses asked Pharaoh to allow the Israelites a three-day journey for their worship, what was the response? The Pharaoh not only disregarded his request, but also intensified the burden of their labor by withholding the straw for brick-making. So the Israelites faced increased hardship. They got frustrated, frustrated, and they turned against Moses, leaving him in, him in a very uh, challenging predicament. So this is chapter 6 now. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go. And with a strong hand... He will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, What does it say? I am the Lord. What tense is that? Present tense. I am the Lord, but he's talking about something that will happen in the future. The future tense. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. What does it mean? Because God is the God of today, but we are relying on something that would happen in the future. And when we don't see something tangible today, we don't believe God as I am. To us, God is the God who was good in the past. He will be good in the future. But today, I don't know where God is. Do you see, uh, we see Abraham was in doubt, Isaac was in doubt, Jacob was in doubt, because even those Bible heroes had a hard time to believe that today when hardships come to our life, it is hard to believe that God is working today. So God is keep telling us, I am who I am. It's not I am who I was. It's not I am who I might be. No, I am who I am. And verse 4, I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. So God says that it's my covenant. The part of my covenant is that they will also become strangers. It takes time for you. You have to understand. It takes time for you to get a freedom. He continues on, says here, verse 5. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, Israel, whom the Egyptians kept in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I, what? Am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. So God says that there was a groaning because of what? Because of the bondage. So at least Israelites, they see some problems. There is a groanings. You were slaves. So I will bring you out, rescue and redeem you. And God of today is promising us for what is coming for the future. He repeat, repeats again, I will, future tense, take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Still, Something, I will do, I will do, so I will be your God. No, I am your God still today. I'm your God who brings you out of under, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. Again, God keeps saying, saying the same thing. I am the Lord. I mean, Bible has only 66 books. There's so many things that God wants to really like summarize. But when God repeats something, 
It is very, very important. And why does God repeat those things? Because we forget. So God has to continually remind us, I am the Lord. It's not, I was your God in the past when I delivered you. Because this is in my journey. This is what I, this is a challenge that I'm experiencing. Because all of us today, when we look back, there were times that you felt like God was there in your life. God did something in the past in your life. But then when there is a new problem that rises up today, and, and, and if I don't see the answer right away, no matter what God did in the past, we start to worry. Are you with me? Am I the only one with these problems? Yes, it doesn't really matter what happened in the past. If my today is difficult, if I don't have answer for today, I start, I start to struggle. I start to question God. So God is giving him these very positive promises. So now Moses is going back to the Israelites. Verse 9. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel. But what happened? But they did not heed Moses. Why? Because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. What stops us from hearing the voice of God? What stopped the Israelites from hearing the voice of God? What is it? The anguish of spirit. The anxiety. The heartache. Heartbreak. The grief. Why did they have this, these emotions. Because when Moses showed up, and when Moses performed all the signs and wonders, which was a supernatural phenomenon, they were like, wow, something supernatural happening. God is going to deliver us quickly. But when that is not happening, when they see the delay, they refuse to trust God. It was their choice. No, we refuse to listen. Sometimes it is our choice. I refuse to listen to God. But then we complain, God is not answering to my prayers. Maybe I was the one, I'm the one who refuses to listen. They thought that they were scammed. This old sorcery, okay, this old scam, we're not going to listen to you anymore. Moses and Aaron, we trusted you. You came up with some sort of like magical play here. But see, when there is a main game, it's not working. The Bible commentary says like this, The anguish of spirit crushed their souls and cruel bondage wearied their bodies day by day. With the result that they lacked both the time and the will to listen. The Samaritan version has an additional to verse 9. It reads, And they said to him, Let us alone, and let us serve the Egyptians, for it is better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. Do you see this? They choose to remain enslaved rather than confront the challenges ahead. And we might find ourselves making similar choices when faced with trials. If our prayers are not immediately answered, we may become discouraged and even surrender to the influence of negativity and evil. I mean, how come you say, well, I'd rather be a slave than facing all these challenges? So Moses went back to God. Verse 12. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh 
hit me, for I am of uncircumcised lips. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But notice here, this is what, this is what uh, Moses is saying to God. They don't even listen to me. Then how even Pharaoh would listen to me? And I told you that I was not a good speaker. Right? Because that's what Moses was arguing when God called him out of the burning bush. He said, I'm not a good speaker. And God says, I will be with you. And he said, oh, no, I can't really do this. Don't worry, I will be with you. But Moses kept saying, no, I, I can't really, I'm not really good at public speaking. I, I'm not good at this. So Moses is saying here as if, the reason why they don't listen to him is because he was not a good speaker. As if they would have listened to him had he been a good speaker. Are you following? He starts to focus on himself again. We would think it's because I'm not ready and prepared in a, in a human standard. There is no answer for the prayers. Maybe I'm not good enough to get the answers from God. Have you ever heard that? Maybe I should do better. I should be a better Christian. It either leads us to uh, two directions. Number one, you would just give up and say, there's no way that I can get there. Are you following? Yeah, I, I, this, that, that standard is way too high for me. There's no way. Lord, did I not tell you that I'm not a good speaker? There's no way that I'm going to be an eloquent speaker. This is not going to happen. Or you may become like Pharisees. You try to become a perfect Christian. You would go a vegan, fasting once a month, listening to 3, 8, 3 8 ABN for two hours a day. Oh, don't get me wrong, those are good things. But when you start to idolize them, when you start to put the condition that, well, I have to, to listen to uh, the Bible books, audio books for two hours, now you start making the checklist what you have to do. then you may become like Pharisees. Because after the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, and so until the book of Malachi, till the book of Matthew, there was a silent period. How many years was that? 400 years. If when you go back to the uh, book, uh, uh, book of Judge, the reason why the Israelites were always invaded by the pagan nations were what? they went back to idol worship, right? So after the exiles, after they came back from Babylon, we noticed that Israelite never fell into idol worship. The whole past cycle that they, were, they repeated throughout the entire book of Judge, book of the Kings, book of Chronicles, now after they came back from the exile, they would never go back to the idol worship. But what did they do instead? They started to build the new restrictions. So keeping the Sabbath wasn't a joyful thing anymore. They make like hundreds of regulations. And Jesus says what? Jesus says what? I am. The Sabbath is for Man. And now, when and Moses is now getting into that direction, start focusing to himself. And this is what we got to do when we are asked to do the ministry. And, and my mom, she's a kind of perfectionist. So uh, she practices like flute and everything. So I hear her, I heard her practic practicing flute 
for like four or five, six years. But she never volunteered herself to play flute at the church. So I asked her, why, 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 aren't you, you know, why, why, why don't you do some special music with the flute? And she says, I am not good enough to be up there. So let me practice until I am really good at, so that when people hear my play, and, uh, the, the, the thing is, until today, she has never been up there. <laughs> That's why God reminds them with his command. It's not about you. I commanded for the children of Israel and for the Pharaoh king of Egypt, I am going to bring the children out of Israel. You are just my instrument. It's not about you speaking eloquently. It's not about you. But when we start to focus on us, I mean, unfortunately, I have observed a trend of young people leaving the church. And I thought about it. And I was young. And, and I think when we're young, in general, we have aspirations and ambition. I wanted to be somebody, like, recognized. Like, I, I, I would say, well, well I, I, want, I want to be like Doug Bachelor. By the way, Doug Bachelor is like Adventist um, tele. Uh, evangelist that a lot of people know. So like, yeah, I want to be like, like him. I want to be up there. I want to be famous. When we were at a, uh, uh, college, freshman in college studying theology, and, and in Korea, I, I, I share with you, um, the system in Korea is more like the West Point. So they only accepted 40 students, giving us 60% scholarship. They were trying to make us to be a pastor, so we were required to stay in a dorm and everything. So the guys that are actually there, in their mind, they, we are going to be a pastor. So what, the, what they're saying, oh, you're going to be a conference president on that conference. You're going to be the conference president on this conference. Nobody is saying, I'm going to be serving a small little church in a small village. Are you following so I see these young people, and they were fired for Christ. They come to these large youth conferences, and they really try to uh, uh, be involved with the leadership. They start bringing their own ministry, setting up their booth and everything. And, and I saw some of them even start their YouTube channels and podcasts, trying to increase their uh, subscribers. But however, as they progress, they realize that those messages, whether it's Adventist message or a Christian message, may not be as popular as they hoped. I used to follow somebody on Instagram. She was a young lady, maybe mid-20s, and, but she had this really good insight that would catch people's like eyes. So she posts certain things on Instagram, and then there's a lot of likes. And, and, and then, all of a sudden, she deleted all her posts and saying that the traditional uh, Advent, Adventist values, Christian values, no longer align with her belief. She claimed that the leaders of the church may not accept her idea, and consequently, she began sharing misleading messages that resonate with skeptics out there. And, and it just breaks my heart, because I, she wasn't the first person that went to that path. Like I saw a lot of young, ambitious young people studying theology, trying to be a pastor, and, 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 and then when they see that it takes a time for them to really establish what they want to establish, the desire for fame and, and, and growing their subscribers for their podcast, YouTube channel. Sometimes they have influ influenced their choices. But when I look into the Bible, Moses became Moses after spending 40 years in the wilderness. Joseph became the Joseph that we know that we admire after being sold as a slave and imprisoned. All the disciples 
by baptizing 3,000, 4,000 a day, every one of Jesus' disciples except John the Revelator met martyr's death. And God had to wait for 40 years for Moses to get ready to represent God. This is a journey that we're taking. The freedom that we are seeking is not something that will be guaranteed just because I am praying and fasting for the last three days. It will take time. And God needs, God needs our cooperation, working with Him. So chapter 7, it goes like this. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. When God says, I made you as God to Pharaoh, meaning you are my representative, you don't have to be eloquent, you don't have to be like a good speaker because I chose you. You're my representative. And Aaron, your prophet, he will be your spokesperson. But I'm telling you, things are not going to be easy. He continue on, continues to say, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgment. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So this is the message for us. Through this scripture here, this is what God is trying to tell us. This is what he says. I don't want to make things difficult for you. But I can't force anyone to make the right choices. There is a power, powerful force of evil at work in the world. And we must stand together to fight against it. However, I want to assure you that ultimately I will triumph. And it's important for you to remain patient and faithful throughout his, this journey. This is what God is telling you and me as we are navigating through the journey in this place. Then the question is, as a young man, how long should I wait? You know, like I'm turning 42. I'm turning 50. How long should I wait? Verse 6, it says, Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was, how old was he? 80 years old, and Aaron, 83 years old, when they spoke to Pharaoh. In my mind, if I am 80 years old, and if God used me big time, then I, by the time when I'm 80, I would have been already retired as a conference president or as a union president, right? It should have been that way. But look at Moses. Look at Aaron. Moses, he was nobody until he was 80 years old. He didn't have any position when he was 80 years old. The question is not about how long should I wait. When is not the question. The question is, do I walk with God on my daily journey? Do I let God mold my character? When we are going through difficult times, those are the questions that we need to ask God. So I talked about the journey of Koreans, how we were trying to achieve the freedom. During the 1980s, when Koreans were fighting for the freedom, by the way, he was the president who made an order to open fire the protesters. 
When Koreans were fighting for the freedom from the military government, the regime implemented a strategy known as the 3S policy. They are sex, screen, sport. The aim was to divert the people's attention from their pursuit of democracy. They permitted the production of adult films, introduced Hollywood movies in theaters, and initiated professional sports leagues, all of which were sponsor, sponsored by the government. Similarly, I believe that Satan utilizes a similar 3S policy to distract us from the necessary trials and preparations for our journey to heaven. Just as the Israelites desire to settle in Egypt as slaves, we can also become distracted, indulging in these three S distractions and content with a state of spiritual bondage. But there is someone who already fought this battle and achieved the victory for you and me, and his name is Jesus Christ. Through his blood, the victory is already given to us. Galatians 5.1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The only name that can give us the ultimate freedom is Jesus Christ. James 1.25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, the freedom, and, persevere, and perseveres, brings bring no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. There is a God's law that we need to meditate, we need to uphold, and that is what gives us the true victory and freedom. John 8, 32 says, And ye shall know the truth. What does ye shall hold the truth? Like, you can hold the Bible as long as you want. The thing is, ye shall know the truth. It's not all about the emotions. You've got to have intellectual connection with God. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How many of you today want to be free from the bondage of sin? Amen? And we can say, let freedom ring.